Hello, my name is Monty Johnson. In this video, I'm going to discuss Aristotle's Politics, Book 1. And this is the first of two parts. In this part, I will discuss the first seven chapters on different kinds of rule, on the definition and parts of the state, and on the defense of slavery and critique of despotic rule. And I'm using the Oxford translation of Benjamin Jowett, which is available in the public domain. First, an outline of the entire book. The first two chapters are devoted to the definition of the state and offer an account of its origin and growth through a combination of its elements, people. And it also draws a distinction between two kinds of rule. In the third chapter, Aristotle introduces the idea of household management or economics as being a presupposition of politics and political science. In chapters four to seven, he offers a critique of despotic rule, that is the rule of masters over slaves. In chapters eight to 11, he describes how household management is distinguished from the art of acquisition, and he offers a critique of wealth getting, which he calls an unnatural form of the art of acquisition. And in the final two chapters, 12 and 13, he differentiates and compares despotic, paternalistic, and political forms of rule. Now, in the first chapter, Aristotle introduces a number of relationships between rulers and ruled and explains that they differ in kind, not merely in quantity. So he discusses a flawed concept of the difference between these different kinds of rulers, a flawed concept that holds that it's just a matter of the quantity of those ruled. So a master rules over one or a few slaves, a household manager rules over a few more people, one or a few slaves, plus his wife, and some children. A king rules over many more, many such households consisting of slaves, wives, and children, and so forth. And finally, a statesman rules over uh, many more and is ruled in turn, he says. The view that these kinds of rule are all part of a single master Science, differentiated only by the quantity of those ruled, is advanced in Plato's Statesman. Aristotle doesn't explicitly re refer to this dialogue, but he says that all of this is a mistake because governments differ in kind, which he says will be evident to anyone who considers the matter according to the method which has hitherto guided us, although he doesn't make it clear exactly which method he has in mind, it is probably explained in his subsequent definition of the state and explanation of how these come into being. Now, he dis defines the state as a community of some kind, and he points out that every community is established with a view to some good, for humans or mankind always act in order to obtain that which they think is good. But if all communities aim at some good, the state or political community which is the highest of all, and which embraces all the rest, aims at good in a greater degree than any other, and at the highest good. So therefore, political science, which corresponds to this state, which aims at uh, all the other goods, and to a greater degree than any other, has a claim for being the highest kind of science. Now he says, as in other departments of science, so in politics, the compound should always be resolved into the simple elements or least parts of the whole. And this is the method that he seems to have referred to in, uh, uh, that I mentioned on the previous slide. He says, we must therefore look at the elements of which the state is composed in order that we may see in what the different kinds of rule differ from one another and whether any scientific result can be attained about each one of them. So this really shows the overall object, I think, of this entire book, which is to distinguish the different kinds of rule, show that they are different in kind and not merely in quantity, and determine to what extent a science corresponds to each one. So for example, if the rule of a master over 
A slave is different from the rule over wives and children, and the rule over wives and children is again different from the rules over equal citizens. Then the question arises whether there is a science corresponding to each of those kinds of rules, a science of mastery, a science of domestic or economic government, and a science of the state or the political community. Now, in chapter 2, Aristotle describes the origin and growth of the state from families and villages, and he even explains how families come together, first advancing a principle of union, which he takes to be a very general principle. So he says, in the first place, there must be a union of those who cannot exist without each other, namely of male and female, that the race may continue. And this is a union which is formed not of deliberate purpose, but because in common with other animals and with plants, mankind have a natural desire to leave behind them an image of themselves. And, again, the principle applies to natural ruler and subject, that both may be preserved, for that which can foresee by the exercise of mind is by nature intended to be lord and master and that which can with its body give effect to such foresight is a subject and by nature a slave. Hence, master and slave have the same interest. So, because of this principle of union, males and females necessarily come together out of a kind of biological necessity to reproduce, but also natural rulers and subjects, that is, masters and slaves, Aristotle asserts, naturally come together. Now, though he assumes that the same principle accounts for the union of both male and female and natural ruler and subject, or master and slaves, he is quick to point out that females and slaves differ by nature. Only barbarians treat their wives as slaves. And the implication is that there is a different kind of rule proper to slaves and proper to women or other spheres of the household, such as children. The former kind of rule we can call despotic, meaning rule of the master, and the latter domestic or paternalistic, the rule of the husband over the wife or of the father over the children. So the origin of the family is that individuals unite together for the sake of basic needs. So, quote, the family is the association established by nature for the supply of men's everyday wants. But the origin of the village is that various families unite for the sake of goods beyond their daily needs, beyond what is necessary just to survive. Quote, when several families are united and the association aims at something more than the supply of daily needs, the first society to be formed is the village. End of quote. Then the state is formed when villages unite for the sake of self-sufficiency and, in fact, the good life. Quote, when several villages are united in a single complete community, large enough to be nearly or quite self-sufficing, the state comes into existence, originating in the bare needs of life and continuing in existence for the sake of a good life. So the family comes to be for the sake of life itself. The origin of the village, the village comes to be for the sake of going beyond those everyday basic needs, and the state for the sake of a kind of self-sufficiency and good life. So Aristotle holds, and this differentiates him from some but not all modern political theorists, but he holds that the state is natural. It is not an artificial thing constructed only by humans. It's a natural thing that arises in nature, and there are analogies in nature among gregarious animals and other kinds of animals like bees and ants and so forth, two things that look like economic and political communities. But humans, he says, are the only true political animals. So, quote, if the earlier forms of society, and he's referring again to families and villages, are natural, then so is the state, for it is the end of them, and the nature of a thing is its end. For what each thing is when fully developed, we call its nature, whether we're speaking of a man, a horse, or a family. So 
in essence, Aristotle sees the state as the final and complete development of the forms of association that we see in families and villages. Those are just, in a way, proto-states. When, when it finally comes to maturity uh, in a state, then we have a complete and self-sufficient uh, good and the possibility of a good life and not mere life and survival. And so Aristotle again conceives of this entire process as natural and says, quote, hence it is evident that the state is a creation of nature and that a human is by nature a political animal. And he who by nature and not by mere accident is without a state is either a bad man or is above humanity. He's like the tribeless, lawless, hearthless one whom Homer denounces, the natural outcast, has been a lover of war, and he may be compared to an isolated piece or pawn in a board game. So here we see, again, the serious view that the state is a creation of nature, that it is a sort of natural development or evolution, and that humans are merely um, activating their nature when they contribute to a political society. And though there are other analogous things to uh, political communities among the animals, humans are clear in a way the most political of animals, and in fact really the only truly political animals because they can use uh, speech and reason and therefore have a sense of good and bad, just and unjust, and convey that to other people and reach agreements and disagreements with them. Quote, now that man is more of a political animal than bees or any other gregarious animals is evident. Nature, as we often say, makes nothing in vain, and man is the only animal whom she has endowed with the gift of speech. And whereas mere voice is but an indication of pleasure or pain and is therefore found in other animals for their nature attains to the perception of pleasure and pain and the intimation of them to one another and no further. The power of speech is intended to set forth the expedient and inexpedient and therefore likewise the just and the unjust and it is characteristic of a human that or a man, that he alone has any sense of good and evil, of just and unjust and the like, and the association of living beings who have this sense makes a family and a state. Now, one implication of this natural development of the state of which uh, humans are a part is that the state is prior to the individual. And also that individual humans can be the best or worst of all natural things. So he offers a kind of part-whole argument to the conclusion that the state is prior to the individual. Quote, the state is by nature clearly prior to the family and to the individual, since the whole is of necessity prior to the part. For example, if the whole body be destroyed, there will be no foot or hand except in an equivalent equivocal sense, as we might speak of a stone hand, for when destroyed the hand will be no better than that, but things are defined by their working and power, and we ought not to say that they are the same when they no longer have their proper quality, but only that they have the same name. The proof that the state is a creation of nature and prior to the individual is that the individual, when isolated, is not self-sufficing, and therefore he is like a part in relation to the whole. But he who is unable to live in society or has no need because he is sufficient for himself must be either a beast or a god. He is no part of a state. A social instinct is implanted in all humans by nature. So humans cannot exist in isolation from a community. They cannot exist as humans. They cannot pursue the good life but they must live like beasts, or if they are entirely self-sufficient, then they must live like gods, but humans occupy a kind of middle condition between these two where they must 
engage in politics. They cannot be sufficient to themselves, but only in the context of a political community. And so a political community is a great benefit to human beings. And quote, yet he who founded the state was the greatest of benefactors. For a human, when perfected, is the best of the animals, but when separated from law and justice, is the worst of all. So Aristotle argues that in the context of a political community, when working together towards the common end, the common good, that humans can achieve the best things in all of nature. But when they're separated from this and separated from law and justice, they can be the worst things in nature. Again, continuing with the quote, since armed justice is the more dangerous and humans are equipped at birth with arms, meant to be used by intelligence and virtue, but which he may use for the worst of ends, wherefore, if he have not virtue, he is the most unholy and the most savage of animals and the most full of lust and gluttony. But justice is the bond of men in states for the administration of justice, which is the determination of what is just, is the principle of order in political society. So the principle of order in political society is justice. And when humans live in accordance with this justice in a political society, they reach the highest fulfillment that any natural thing is capable of. When they pervert it or deform it or attempt to live apart from it, they live in some kind of subhuman or bestial uh, condition. And in fact, can be the most, as he says, unholy and savage of all the animals who cannot, of course, rival humans in their um, vice and ability to do evil because we possess such more effective arms, a point far more true in the age of nuclear weapons than it was in the time Aristotle was writing, but the same point obtains. Now, in the third chapter, Aristotle introduces the idea of household management as a necessary part of the state. And here he really describes um, the various parts of the household. So since the state is made up of these family households, we have to consider what makes up a family household itself. And by the way, the Greek term for a family household is oikia, and this is the root of English words like economics and ecology, economics being the laws of household management, ecology being something like the scientific account of the environment or the dwelling in which uh, we live. Now, the fewest parts of a family household are master and slave, husband and wife, father and children, Aristotle says. He says, you also need an art of acquisition that's part of household life, but most of household life consists of a set of ruling and ruled relationships. The master-slave relationship, which we call despotic, the husband-wife relationship, which we call domestic, father-child relationship, paternalistic, and the acquisition and management of resources used by the household we call economic. And Aristotle treats each of those subjects in the subsequent chapters of this book. So he discusses despotic rule in chapters 4 to 7, domestic rule and paternalistic rule in chapter 12, and economic rule, including acquisition and management of household resources, in chapters 8 to 11. So again, this point about differentiation of kind of rule structures the entire book. Now, why does he discuss it in this order? Why does he immediately go on to discuss master and slave and not husband and wife or father and child, which you might think by nature are prior? Aristotle says, let us speak first of master and slave, looking to the needs of practical life and also seeking to attain some better theory of their relation than exists at present. For some are of the opinion that the rule of a master is a science and that the management of a household and the mastership of slaves and the political and royal rule, as I was saying at the outset, are all the same. 
So again, the reason he wants to return this point is because he wants to show that these are these various kinds of rule are not the same, and they are not different just on the basis of the quantity of who is ruled, but they differ in kind. And that difference in kind can be uh, between, for example, political or even domestic and paternalistic rule and despotic rule um, can be shown most clearly by contrast to despotic rule. So in chapter four and the next three chapters, Aristotle discusses uh, despotic rule. The rule of master over a slave, he says, is a necessary part of household management. So he's just mentioned some people who think that it's an important science and some people who even think that the science of politics is essentially the same thing, just a matter of a difference of quantity. He points to other people who, quote, affirm that the rule of master over slaves is contrary to nature and that the distinction between slave and freeman exists by law or by convention only and not by nature, and being an interference with nature is therefore unjust. That, he says, at the very end of chapter 3. So in chapter 4, he discusses their view. Now, who are these critics of slavery? Aristotle doesn't name them, and we're not sure. They may have been radical Democrats who actually argued for extending the right to of political rights to former slaves, or at least those who are worthy among former slaves. It could have been sophists who argued for all kinds of controversial subjects, like giving encomiums to Helen of Troy, or arguing that nothing exists, and so forth. Uh, it could have been um, early cynical philosophers who uh, claimed that there is no distinction between um, the mass of humanity and slaves or non-philosophers and slaves. Sophists and early cynics made a big um, distinction between uh, what exists by nature and what exists merely by law or convention. This appears to be an argument of, the, of that kind. And so those are pretty good guesses. But the fact of the matter is we don't know who these are. The views of opponents of slavery have not been preserved. It's not hard to see why, because the people who could afford to copy books were probably mostly slave owners and people who didn't want those other arguments copied out. And so uh, it was a lot more likely that the arguments in favor of slavery would be copied out by the people paying for these kind of books, perhaps. Now, Aristotle offers two prima facie arguments in favor of rule of masters over slaves, and over the next couple of slides we'll look in detail at each of those arguments. The first is that slaves are necessary tools, that is, they're tools that are necessary for the natural functioning of the family household. Again, the family household is a natural part of the village, and the village the natural a natural part of the state, and so slaves are necessary tools for the natural functioning of the entire state. Further, the second argument is that slaves are actually parts of their masters and are imperfect or incomplete somehow without them. Okay, so the first of those two arguments, which we can call the hypothetical necessity argument, that if we're going to live the good life or if the household is going to be managed correctly and in accordance with nature, then slaves will be necessary. They aren't sort of absolutely necessary, but they are necessary on the hypothesis that some natural end is going to be achieved. And so here's a kind of reconstruction of that argument. First, we assume that property, like land, buildings, tools, uh, is hypothetically necessary part of the household. Without it, a family household can't possibly exist or sustain itself, and it would be impossible for anyone to live well without these things. And living well is, again, the natural end of both the household and the state. Now, second, tools are hypothetically necessary property. Without tools, Property itself cannot possibly be used correctly or used well, so you need tools 
for building buildings, for maintaining buildings, for cultivating land, for constructing and making use of other tools, and even, as we'll see, using other tools. So this third premise is that slaves are hypothetically necessary tools, tools being of two kinds, one kind animate, the other inanimate. The animate ones, Aristotle argues, are primary because they engage in activities that use the tools. The other tools merely help produce the things that we need. So he compares a uh, rudder on a ship as a kind of inanimate tool to um, a pilot who is a kind of animate uh, tool. You need both kinds in order for these to function, and slaves are necessary uh, for tools to be used property, properly. Now, here Aristotle actually digresses to uh, make a quite extraordinary remark. He says, quote, if every instrument could accomplish its own work, obeying or anticipating the will of others, like the statues of Daedalus or the tripods of Hephaestus, which, says the poet, of their own accord entered the assembly of the gods, if in like manner the shuttle would weave and the plectern touch the lyre without a hand to guide them, chief workmen would not want servants, nor masters slaves. So he actually sort of imagines a situation where through, you know, some kind of perhaps technological innovation, tools could work themselves, could be automated to sort of automatically do the work. So you could have a kind of automatic robotic uh, person to work your, uh, a robot to work your uh, vacuum, and then you wouldn't need uh, servants to do it or other people to do it. As it is, um, tools can't work themselves, and so they require animate workers in order to function correctly. And of course, we need them to function correctly in order to maintain our property, and we need to maintain our property in order to maintain the household that is necessary for the state to exist and for us to flourish and have the good life. Therefore, we draw the conclusion that slaves are hypothetically necessary for the natural end of the state, that is the good life, uh, to come about. Now, the second kind of argument might be independent is another kind of part-whole argument, and this results in a definition of a slave as a human that is possessed by another. So, quote, a possession is spoken of as a part is spoken of, for the part is not only a part of something else, but wholly belongs to it, and this is also true of a possession. So a thing that's possessed is like a part of its possessor. And the master is only the master of the slave. He doesn't belong to the slave, whereas the slave is not only the slave of his master, but wholly belongs to him. And a possession may be defined as an instrument of action separable from the possessor, but still, according to the prior premise, still belonging to him. Hence, we see what is the nature and office of a slave, and here's the definition, quote, he who is by nature not his own but another's human being is by nature a slave, and he may be said to be another's human being who, being a human being, is also a possession. So the question then becomes, who among us, among human beings, is a possession and is another's human being? And that, of course, adverts to the question, who is, by nature, a slave? So the next task is going to be determine if anyone is, by nature, a slave, and if so, who? So this leads Aristotle to discuss the appearance of despotic rule or power in nature itself. So he again asks, is there anyone intended by nature to be a slave and for whom such a condition is expedient and right, or rather is not all slavery a violation of nature? So this is one of the clearest and earliest extant raisings of that question, whether or not slavery 
is not actually contrary to nature and thus unjust. But Aristotle says that there's no difficulty in answering the question. He says on grounds of both reason and fact, for that some should rule and others be ruled is a thing not only necessary, but expedient. From the hour of their birth, some are marked out for subjection, others for rule. Now, he makes this argument on the basis of a kind of inductive argument or argument from analogy, where he describes seven or eight kinds of natural hierarchical relationships between rulers and ruled that uh, seem to exist out there in nature in parallel to one another. So he says, in even if we take inanimate substances, there is a kind of dominant element in them. Um, and this is like a ruler compared to the other elements that exist in those things which are ruled. So the dominant, if the dominant element in the thing is fire, then it will tend to be hot, even if it contains a bit of uh, earth or water, which would be cold. These get ruled and dominated by the dominant element. And he says in musical melodies, even among notes, there's the kind of keynote and then the other notes. Um, and this he describes as a kind of ruler-ruled relationship, one on a par with master-slave relationships. Among living things, he says, the soul is naturally a ruler and the body is naturally ruled. So we think that my mind or my soul rules my body and that parts of my body, like my um, hands or my legs, are like my servants or slaves, and that I should not be enslaved to my hand or my feet, but it, my hand or my feet should be enslaved to me. And in souls in general, the intellect or the rational part rules the appetite or irrational part by nature. And in nature, among animals, humans naturally rule the irrational animals or beasts. And this is parallel in the social sphere, in marriages, uh, males rule females or husbands rule wives, in families, parents rule children. And then now we should be prepared for the example we're wondering about in households, there's a natural relationship between master and slave. And in Aristotle's view, in each case, it is better that those who are ruled are ruled and that the ruler is dominant. So it is better in producing melodies that the keynote really rule the other notes. And it's really better for living things if their souls or minds rule their body parts and not vice versa, or that their intellect rules their appetites and they aren't led around like a slave, he elsewhere says, by their appetites. Uh, certainly it would be absurd if beasts ruled over humans. He thinks it's equally absurd, although perhaps it's not, if females rule over males, um, as the idea that children would rule over parents. No, these would all be violations of, a, of an apparent natural order of things that includes the rule of masters over slaves, and it's better that masters rule over slaves than vice versa. So this leads to a conclusion and a revised definition of the slave, where then there is such a difference as that between soul and body, or between men and animals, as in the case of those whose business is to use their body and who can do nothing better, the lower sort are by nature slaves. And it is better for them, as for all inferiors, that they should be under the rule of a master. For he who can be, and therefore is, another's, and he who participates in a rational principle enough to apprehend, but not to have such a principle, is a slave by nature. Now, in chapter 6, Aristotle describes further critics and um, defenders of conventional slavery, which is can be differentiated from this natural kind of slavery, which he has just set out by analogy to other natural things. He points out that unnamed um, 
people have taken the opposite view, and he says, importantly, that they, in a certain way, um, are right. Uh, and that can easily be seen, and that's because the word slavery and slave are used in different senses. There are those who are slaves, and there is slavery that exists only by law or convention, as well as by nature. So there's a law that says whoever is taken in war is supposed to belong to the victors. But this right to take and possess and own other people as spoils of war, many jurists, he says, without naming them, impeach as they would an orator who brought forward an unconstitutional measure. This is a quote. They detest the notion that because one man has the power of doing violence and is superior in brute strength, another should be his slave and subject. End of quote. Now, the response to this is that power implies virtue, and virtue implies justice, and superior power is naturally found where there is superior excellence, and superior excellence is naturally able to exercise the greatest power. So that makes it seem as if those who are exercising power must actually be just by virtue of the fact that they have power. But there's really two different concepts of justice at play here, one being something like goodwill, the other power, power or rule of those who happen to be stronger. Now, critics of slavery embrace the idea that justice is something like goodwill, whereas advocates of conventional slavery define justice as mere power or rule of the stronger. So they say that slavery is just because slaves are ruled by those who are stronger, their masters. And thus, one can object to the position and say that doesn't make it just, just because they the powerful rule or the mighty get their way doesn't mean that justice is served. So Aristotle describes a criticism of conventional slavery. If Even if those who are taken in war are justly enslaved, what if the war itself is unjust? Well, then the enslavement would have to be unjust, and so all those taken slaves in an unjust war would not justly be slaves. Or suppose that one's grandparents were Greek nobles who were captured and sold at the end of an unjust war. As a result, one's parents were born into slavery, and so was oneself. Then both the descendants of Greek nobles and descendants of their slaves would be slaves by convention. And so People would naturally be both slaves and not slaves, which seems like a contradiction. So this conventional idea of slavery, that it's just, seems wrong. Quote, wherefore Greeks do not like to call Greeks slaves, but confine the term to barbarians, yet in using this language they really mean the natural slave of, of whom we spoke at first, for it must be admitted that some are slaves everywhere, others nowhere. So Aristotle here restricts his justification of slavery only to those who are natural, the so-called natural slaves. And all the others, those who either were captured in war or were born to those who were captured in war, their descendants, none of those people does he have any justification for their slavery. Again, he claims to have justification for certain natural slaves. All we have seen so far is that there is an analogy between the idea of natural slaves and certain other kinds of natural ruled, ruler and ruled relationships, and we haven't really seen the way to identify who is naturally and actually a slave. But Aristotle next argues that some slaves are not just conventionally, but naturally slaves. Quote, they think that as men and animals beget men and animals, so from good men a good man springs, but this is what nature, though she may intend it, cannot always accomplish. 
So that seems to indicate that sometimes good people can produce defective children, that is, children with certain kinds of congenital defects, and that such people will then naturally be slaves. It also seems to imply that good people could produce, as a freak accident, as a genetic mutation or something, could actually produce good people who wouldn't be slaves, um, that would have a certain mental quality, for example, such that they weren't naturally slaves. Now, neither of those practices were widely observed at the time that he was writing, but that's a theoretical possibility opened by his argument. So next he says, quote, we see then that there is some foundation for this difference of opinion and that all are not either slaves by nature or freemen by nature, and also that there is in some cases a marked distinction between the two classes, rendering it expedient and right for the one to be slaves and the others to be masters, the one practicing obedience, the others exercising the authority and lordship with nature intended them to have. So nature marks out certain people as defective and who are in need of the leadership, authority, and lordship of somebody else who naturally has it. And according to Aristotle, quote, the abuse of this authority is injurious to both, for the interests of part and whole, of body and soul, are the same, and the slave is a part of the master, a living but separated part of his bodily frame, but a lot like a connected body part. So again, if I think of my hand as being like my slave, it better do whatever I want. My mind uh, controls my hand, and it is better for my hand and for me in general if my mind controls my hand and my hand doesn't spasmatically control the rest of my body or something like that. But I should not abuse this authority. Injuring my hand injures me, and so a master shouldn't injure the slave, because that's like injuring himself, injuring a part of himself. Now, the difference is that this part of himself is separate from his bodily frame, but it is still metaphysically considered part of the master. Hence, he says, and this is a quote, where the relation of master and slave between them is natural, they are friends and have a common interest, but where it rests merely on law and force the reverse is true. So if we look at each of those natural composite holes in which there's a ruler-ruled relationship, in every case, the ruler rules in the interests of uh, himself, but also in the interests of the ruled. And it is better for the ruled to be ruled. It's better for my body parts to be ruled by my mind. It's better for my appetites to be ruled by my intellect. It's better for um, beasts and animals to be ruled by humans. It's better, in theory, for females to be ruled by males, and it is better for slaves to be ruled by masters. Better for them. Now, uh, we can make a comparison of the different sciences that correspond to these different kinds of ruling. So we've just shown that the kinds of rule differ by nature, and there are also corresponding kinds of knowledge or sciences which, which uh, correspond to each of these kinds of rule. So there is actually a science of being a master, but also a science of being a slave. And both of these sciences are, according to Aristotle, teachable. But he says, quote, this so-called science is not anything great or wonderful, for the master need only know how to order that which the slave must know how to execute. So yes, being a master is a science, being a slave is a science, but they aren't that big of a deal. So the so-called despotic science of ruling within a household is um, natural and necessary, but not a great or wonderful thing. Hence, Aristotle says, those who are in a position which places them above toil have stewards who attend to their households while they occupy themselves with philosophy or with politics. So if I have enough slaves carrying out the necessities 
uh, within my household, I free up time to do philosophy or politics and thus realize the good life and a true kind of uh, flourishing. But we can distinguish within the, within the household this despotic relationship between master and slave. We can actually differentiate it between the other kinds of rule within a household among um, members who are also unequal, as slaves are to masters, but the relationship is between free people. So husband and wife are both free, even though the husband rules the wife, and the parents uh, 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 who rule the children, both the children and the parents, are free. Now, it's only in the context of a fully developed state where we have free and equal people ruling over free and equal people, but they take turns ruling and being ruled that we get the true political kind of rule and a kind of constitutional kind of rule as opposed to these despotic and monarchical or paternal kinds of rule. So let me conclude this first part of part one of Aristotle's politics by making some observations about his treatment of slavery. Because the theory has been widely influential, and anybody who's interested in arguments for or against slavery must read and grapple with Aristotle's arguments. Other kinds of arguments have been invoked from other literary sources in the history of slavery, including most obviously the Bible. But Aristotle has lent intellectual authority to certain claims about slavery. But a lot of these extensions of his theory are actually quite problematic. As I've argued here, his primary interest is showing that kinds of rule differ not only in quantity but in kind. So political power is different than economic or paternalistic power, and paternalistic power is different than despotic power. And Aristotle critiques despotic power in several ways. And it's important that we acknowledge that he is, that his text presents the most complete critique of slavery that survives from the ancient world. And even though he's one of the most influential people in justifying slavery, his criticism of slavery is also one of the most influential. So he considers the kind of knowledge that corresponds to the master to be nothing great and to be much inferior to the kind of political power or rule that pertains to equals. And second, he recognizes that the dominant form of slavery, taking and selling captives in war, is contrary to nature and in fact unjust. Now, if we focus on the existence of people who suffer from some kind of congenital mental defect such that they're incapable of using reason to direct their own lives for the better in their own interest, then there may actually be some who fit Aristotle's conception of a natural slave. For example, those who due to congenital defect are severely mentally impaired, or others who are so through senility, or those like prisoners who through their criminal actions show a kind of mental impairment in the form of vice, we think it's justified to deprive these people of freedom. And we appoint others, guardians, wardens, etc., in order to make decisions on their behalf. And we think that this is not only just, but we think that it's justified and that it is in the interest of those who are ruled that somebody else make decisions on their behalf. But such examples of mentally disabled people apply only in those cases where the subject, the so-called slave, would actually benefit by being deprived of freedom. And it would actually be cruel and unusual to leave them to make their own decisions. But this doesn't describe accurately, at least, the vast majority of those who were actually enslaved when Aristotle was writing. And it would, of course, be invalid to extrapolate from the natural or just enslavement of such mentally impaired people that slavery in general, or as it is actually practiced, is justified. Now, it's not clear whether or not 
or if so, how, Aristotle expects us to extrapolate from the theoretical existence of some form of natural slavery to the justice of slavery as it was then being practiced. In fact, he himself seems to argue, offer arguments against making such an extrapolation with his critique and differentiation of conventional from natural slavery. So where we end up at this part in the politics is a differentiation of despotic rule from political rule, political rule being stipulated rule between equals, despotic rule the paradigmatic kind of rule between unequals. And Aristotle has shown which form of that he considers to be natural. It remains for the other chapters in this book and thus for the next lecture to discuss the other kinds of rule that are exhibited within the household, the rule of husband over wife and of parents over children, and then other kinds of economic power that are exerted because they are necessary components of household management, and household management is a necessary component of political science. So stay tuned for that. Thank you.